Oh, if it were so, huh? I'm so afraid to tell the story. I almost once time told the story. I heard about people who like to tell the story. May it be, Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Great to be together this morning. Uh, you can take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 8. We'll get there in a few minutes. And uh, while you're turning there, you can join my fellowship in reciting Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Hopefully for my fellowship's even here. Goodness. All right. <laughs> Joel, Jess and Joel, you and me. Here we go. Ready? Oh, man. Sage fright. We, we, I challenged everybody last week to, to try to memorize Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And the first word is what? Go. Man, we're making progress. We'll see you next week. Hallelujah. All right. Go. Go, therefore, into all the nations and make, and baptize, make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Can we say that together now that everybody realizes it's on the wall? All right. <laughs> Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we, we got go and low. We got those two things down. We'll just add the words along the way as we go. We're doing well. We're doing well. We're doing well. The reason why uh, I, I'm starting with this verse again is because we are continuing to look at uh, what the mission of the Christian church is, which is to go and make disciples of all the nations. Right? After people hear the gospel, they would make the decision to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord, as their master. And then they would begin what will be a lifelong journey of uh, being taught by the Lord and by other disciples to observe whatever He commands. All right? Now, I wanted to make a point. I had an excellent conversation with my wife. I realized last night that my wife is so often the voice of the Holy Spirit, welcomed or not, in my life. <laughs> Can I get an amen from all the uh, wives this morning and all the husbands too? Okay. And, and so she's asking me some questions, of course, right before we go to sleep. You know what I mean? Right before the sermon has been done for hours. And this is great. She asked me a simple question. And so in light of that question, I wanted to clarify some things about discipleship. Discipleship is going into the world and, and uh, preaching the gospel to people that don't know anything about Jesus Christ. Amen? Disciple, uh, making disciples is, is within the context of the church, people that have already determined to follow Jesus Christ, but are at different levels, helping them to grow, to become more devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? See, it's both. It's all, it's both. The answer to that question is yes. It's not just one, it's not just the other. And, and the idea is, is that we want to become... Um, disciple makers in our head and in our heart so that when we're interacting with people genuinely not out of a robotic like I'm supposed to make disciples um, that that we are engaging with people wherever they're at I was with I, I really wanted to speak the word to someone yesterday and I was praying about it and I knew I was going to be interacting with people that didn't know the Lord and I was really praying about it and, and so I got a chance to have a very long conversation with someone uh, and really get into the depths of his heart. He was very honest and open about his life. And he was at discipleship level zero. So my interaction with him would be different than interacting with one of you, maybe at discipleship level eight or seven or six or something like that, right? right? Or Tom, 10. Okay. So, so the idea is we need to focus on our relationships with each other here within the church with the older teaching the younger and the mature working with the immature and, and, and uh, we'll talk about this more but in our conversations helping each other know what the Lord said to be more committed to following what He said right? more than just hanging out and, and having fun although that's certainly a part of us living together um, but it's also when we're not here what, level, what discipleship level is the person you're with it might be zero so you're going to interact them, with them in a different way so it's both 
It's all. Is it, is it, it's going out into the world with, with new people. It's interacting within the church with people that are just coming along or have been around for a while. We need to do both. We just need to be disciple makers wherever we are. Amen? So uh, let's look at Acts uh, 8. What we're going to do this morning is we are the sermon's broken into three parts. Number one, this is part two of Disciples Make Disciples. Last week we talked about that disciples make other disciples. Not just Jesus making disciples, but disciples also make disciples. And the first thing we're going to look at is what it looks like for disciples to make disciples. What are the actions that disciples take to make other disciples? All right. First thing we're going to look at is action. And Acts 8 gives us a great, uh, a great key here. Acts 8 verse 5 says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip, and as they heard, they saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case, many of them had unclean spirits, and they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So that there was what? Much rejoicing in that city. That's our prayer for Warwick, isn't it? That people would see the Lord and there would be great rejoicing in our town, right? The first key that we need to be mindful of if we are disciples going to make disciples is we need to go where people are. That's what Philip did. He went where people were. They may have known the Lord already. They may have not known the Lord already. They were on that scale maybe of 0 to 10, whatever. But if you want to be a disciple who makes disciples... You have to go where people are. That's another one of those, I can close the book and we could all go home and just let that marinate. Oh, wait, what are you saying? I can't just stay home and uh, update my Facebook status all day? No, you can't. You have to go where people are, right? You have to be where people are. It could be a huge crowd. It could be two people. But for us to uh, follow this commission of Matthew 28, we need to be where people are. All right? That sounds good? All right, let's go to Matthew 15 very simple day. It's a very simple day. I think some of us will appreciate the uh, simplicity here. You need to go where people are. You go where people are. And that, you know, that's not a small thing for me. The reason I bring that up is we are, we are living in an increasingly uh, insular society, right? Uh, you know, we, 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 uh, we chat, we video chat with someone in China. But we don't even know our neighbors' names. You know what I mean? We, we uh, can text uh, a million people at once. But like when we're with one other person, we don't know how to communicate at all. Right? So we're texting each other, standing right next to each other, just because that's the only way we know how to communicate. Right? So it's important for us to realize that, especially as the days grow closer and closer to us, being more isolated, and similar, that we realize if we want to make disciples, we need to be where people are. Your people are. The second thing is in Acts 15, we looked at uh, these verses last week, verse 35. Paul and Barnabas, they stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city which we preached the word of the Lord and see how they are. And see how they are. See that in verse 36, Acts 15, 36? Did I say the wrong thing? See, I'm having trouble. All of you people, I just, you know, if I could text it or something, maybe. <laughs> Acts 15, we'll try it again. Acts 15. Are you there yet, Mr. Number 10? Yeah? Good? Good? Right. Uh, Acts, Acts, I almost said Acts 10. Acts, 5, Acts 15. My goodness, just read it. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city which we proclaim the word of the Lord, and what? See how they are. See how they are. Another uh, element of the actions of discipleship is follow-up. Is follow-up and frequenting the same places that you may have been. All right? So you've got to be where people are. And it's also a good idea to go to the same places that you go to to interact with the same people. Here's how we can practically apply this, right? 
uh, if you wake up in the morning and you have to get your Dunkin' Donuts coffee, go to the same Dunkin' Donuts every day. I know that's hard, all these choices of all the Dunkin' Donuts. Do I go on the right side of the road or the left side of the road? <laughs> right, exactly. And, and so we would, we go, to, we, frequent, we frequent similar places and we have follow-up with the people that we're interacting with. Right? Because discipleship, uh, most often, is not just going to be a one-and-done encounter or something. But it's going to be a long-term investment that you make. Isn't that true with our relationships here within the church? Right? It's not just a one-and-done, like, hey, do you believe in the Lord Jesus? Yes. All right. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus? Yes. Okay. But we, we enter into relationships where there would be follow-up. We would see, how are you doing? Right? Uh, Pam, if you don't mind me sharing, she told him. It doesn't matter, right? She told me... <laughs> She told me this story about when she was a, a new believer in Michigan, right? That um, she, you had actually sort of like withdrawn from the... Michigan sense. Oops. Wicked, wicked. That's right. Yeah. Here we go. Hallelujah. Right. Uh, that's that's what it means to be a disciple maker. That that you are willing to commit to a long term investment in other people's lives. Some of us may, may make one disciple our whole lives. I, I don't want to set that as a standard for all of us. I hope we make thousands, all of each one of us in this room. But, but if we're faithful to what the Lord has given us and working with that person and calling that person and reaching out in love and, and, and uh, you know, not, we're not talking nag. We're not talking, you know, we're not talking nag. It wasn't a nag. It was a genuine concern of love. How are you doing? I just want to let you know what's going on in case you wanted to come. You know, that's, that's a good thing for us to do. We want to be disciple makers. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. They went back to see how everyone was doing. They went back to see how everyone was doing. Acts uh, 18 now. These, this first part of our, of our message this morning, very practical. Very practical. Go where people are. Follow up with people that you've met and talked to. In, begin to invest in a long-term relationship with the people in this church and with the people that you get to speak to. Uh, this is more of that in Acts 18, verse 4. Paul, what did he do? He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks. Right? That was their Dunkin' Donuts. Well, no, it wasn't, but just follow along with me here. Right? Every weekend, he went to the same place and interacted with the same people. Right? He went and he interacted with people in a consistent basis so that they would know his name, that you would know their name. Right? We don't have to... Uh, in a, we can go to the grocery store and not have to interact with anyone the whole time except the person we're talking to on our cell phone the entire the entire time. Right? Because we can pick up one of those little handheld zappers. Right? And that makes our lives completely convenient and easier. But guess what it takes out of it? It takes out the interpersonal communication of interacting with people in a way like Paul would. He'd go to the same place and be with the same people. So, so my encouragement of how to practically apply this is just what I said before. Go to, if you're going to go to Dunkin' Donuts, or no offense to those of you that are like, Dunkin' Donuts, how can I ever go to Dunkin' Donuts? You know, Paul's a honeydew guy, right? Paul's a honeydew. Paul, you know, if he goes to the same honeydew, they begin to know his name. He begins to know their name, right? You go on to the same, the same teller at the bank. Just, just to have in your heart and your mind the opportunity to just get to know people, to interact with them. If we're not talking with people, if we're not interacting with people, it's not, we're not going to be disciple makers. We're not. Same thing is true here with church, right? Some of you sit in the same seat. I'm going to guess that's because you want to meet the people in the row next to you. That's why. Wait, you're not in the same seat. Hallelujah. Disciple makers right here. Wait, that, whatever. All right, let's keep going. Acts uh, 18, verse 11. 
Crispus, we read this last week, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but what? Go on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And then what, he, what did he do? He settled there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God to them. He spent time with the people who showed interest in the things of God and a long-term commitment, right? He, would, he, would spend, he spent a year and a half with these people. His life, he had the heart of a disciple maker, so he interacted with people for an extended period of time. Some of us may be in a season where we're reaching out to one person right now, maybe in the church or at your job or something like that, and you're going to devote, and we need to devote, a certain amount of time spending, just spending time with them. Just spending time with them. If we're going to help people follow the Lord, we need to spend time with them. Not just the niceties and the hellos and hand them a, you know, uh, leave your, uh, those of you that have been servers before, maybe this happened to you, like, just leave them a tract in the, you know, no tip, but just a tract in, in the bill after you uh, eat at a restaurant, right? That happened in the South a lot to me, right? There's no tip. It just says, see gospel tract, you know, eternal reward or something like that. I mean, I got to pay the bills. How is it going to help me? Not that. Spending time with people. If you want to be a disciple maker, you have to be where people are. You have to frequent the same places. And you have to spend time with the people you're with. Amen? Acts 19. This is one of my favorite ones. Acts 19. Verse uh, 1. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and he found some what? disciples. So this is a case of the people, this isn't like a evangelism experience. These are people already in the church and he's working with them. Okay? And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? What kind of statement is that? A question. That's a question. Right? Everyone's like spiritualizing. It's a... Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? question mark and then he said to them they, what they do they answered no we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit and he said to them into what then were you baptized what kind of statement is that a question good job and they said answering into John's baptism Paul said John baptized with the baptism of repentance teaching people to believe in him who was coming after him that is Jesus and when he heard this they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Paul laid hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. One of the things, the actions that disciple makers take is that they're, they ask people questions. They engage in relationship with people and especially those of us within the church, we should ask each other questions, right? If Tom is, is trouble with something uh, or I'm trouble with something, we can ask each other questions to see how things are going. That's a good way for disciple makers to assess where we are on this spectrum. Of things, right? Joe has been coming to the church for a year now, and and I begin to relationship with him. And I'm trying to, you know, we're we're, we're uh, becoming good friends, and we're, we're spending time praying together, and bowling together, and and going to the same Dunkin' Donuts together, and not using the stop and shop zapper thing together. We're doing all these things, and and just in our uh, conversation, when he talks to me, instead of uh, instead of him just telling me everything about the Lord. He says, well, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? Isn't that what a good teacher does, right? What do you, what do you think about this verse? What kind of statement is that? Question. Right, exactly. So a good thing to do for us is to ask questions and engage. It's not just a, uh, you know, we're not just walking around with a bullhorn. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. We're, we're real people talking to other real people, and we engage with them through questions and normal conversation. I shouldn't have to say this, but unfortunately, there are, you know, some of our brethren that have gone down the bullhorn route and aren't engaging with people like I think the disciples did. Acts 14 now. We should go where people are. We should follow up with them, spend time with them, ask questions, engage with them. Uh, Acts 14 is a great one that we thought of in our fellowship on Wednesday. Verse 21, And after they preached the gospel to the city, 
and had made many what? Disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. And what did they do? They strengthened the soul of the disciples doing what? Encouraging them. Encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And then it continues on. A huge important thing that we need to keep in mind if we're going to be disciple makers is that we are encouragers. Encouragers. That's not just this like nice 21st century, like we're in a sensitive society, so let's be kind to people. This is what they're doing in the first century church. People need to be encouraged. If they're coming on following the Lord and turning from their old life, man, there's going to be some difficult times and they're going to need you and I to give them a word of encouragement, to tell them that they're doing great, to remind them when they're discouraged how far they've come in their journey with the Lord. I mean, that is so important. We need to be, if we're disciple makers, encouragers. Amen? Amen? Amen. You guys just, every time I say amen, you just say it just so well right back. And I just wanted to compliment you how good you are at saying amen. Amen. Amen? There you get it again. You guys are just the best. Amen? Oh. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and when you get there, say amen. Amen. <laughs> so here's, um, this is the last thing we'll look at in this heading of what it looks like, action, because this is just the best. Now, Acts chapter 2, you know, I don't want us to read this now saying, like, we have to make sure that all these things are checked off our list so we're not authentic disciple makers. But the, but the idea is this is what it looks like to be in a relationship with people in the church and outside of the church that you're helping them to obey the Lord's commandments. Verse, um, let's start in verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So when they got together, they talked about the teachings. They talked about the words of God, right? Did they have a good time? Yes, we're going to read in a minute that they ate together, and I'm sure they had a great time. But one of the things that characterized them in their time together is that they talked about the words of God. The words of God. The apostles' teaching. And to fellowship. Spending the time together, sharing their hearts. And to breaking of bread. And to prayer. One thing that Pam has taught me very uh, well is that one of the best ways to engage in people on a great level is to have a meal with them. Isn't that true? Right, to have a meal with them, you know, you just you let your guard down, you're not worried about, you know, the awkwardness of the relationship. You're just having a good time eating a hot dog or whatever, you know, or a hamburger or, or a filet mignon. If you go to the Winfield's house, that's what happened. And to prayer. They pray together. I'd like to get in the habit of that more. I know there's been a couple times I've had people visit me that were really weary, and before they went out on their trip, we prayed together. It was wonderful. Like, I, I have strong memory of that, unfortunately, because it's not a common practice. I'd like to be more. When I'm with you guys, when we're together, when we're with a new believer, whatever it is that we, we end our time, we spend our time praying together too, praying for each other. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and they were sharing with them as anyone might have need. When, you, you know, when you're in a relationship with someone you're discipling, you're going to find out about needs that they have and you can help meet their need, whether physically or, or uh, spiritually. Day by day, continue with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They, they spent time together. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. There are three references, my goodness, <laughs> of food. If you don't think this church is a first century kind of church, <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> it's funny, huh? They were taking their meals together and praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were going to be saved. They, you know, the actions of a disciple maker is that you, you're loving them, you're encouraging them, you're patient with people, you're praying with people, you're listening with people. And, and, and here are two thoughts I had of that, in light of that. If we're going to be committed to make disciples, we need to be prepared to modify our schedules in order to be in the position to make disciples. That means we might be home late from running a quick errand because while you were at the grocery store, you were able to help someone and speak the word to someone. 
and so you're going to come home a little bit late. You might stay up a little bit later than you would have normally on a weekend because a brother is at your house and you're helping each other remain faithful. New people are coming to your home. Right at the point you're ready to turn it down for the night. And bed, right? And the feet go up. Whoop, and then a new believer comes over, right? We should be prepared to arrive early and stay late so that we can continue this mission of making disciples. Amen? I'll never forget one time my wife, uh, she, I, I don't remember, uh, this was a few years ago, but she um, was working, tutoring someone, and she ended up staying at this person's house and ministering to the, the student that she was tutoring's mother. Now, I am, I am freaking out. Because my wife's supposed to be home at 5 o'clock, and it's now 6 o'clock. Don't ter tell her I'm telling you this. But I started getting very worried. I started you know, calling her. Of course, she didn't have her cell phone, ladies. Of course, they leave the cell phone in the car. But if you call us and we don't answer right away, oh my goodness, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> and I'm worried, and I'm worried, right? And I call her, the, the boss, to try to get the phone. I mean, this is an hour. This isn't like five minutes late. This is an hour late. I'm starting to get worried, okay? And, and I, I look on the news. Was there an accident? I mean, I'm like, this is ridiculous. I know, I know. Pray for, pray for your pastors and teachers, okay. Um, and, so, and so I'm getting worried. And then, and then concept, I thought, I should pray for her. Okay, so after I've called 911 and, you know, the governor's office and the National Guard's out looking for her, I pray. And the Lord told me, she's witnessing to someone. She'll be home when she's done. Peace. She came home. Babe, I'm so sorry. My cell phone died. Why? Well, of course it did, right? It was in my car anyway. But you'll never believe what I got to do. Right? I was not prepared for the fact that my wife was committed to be a disciple maker and had the opportunity. So guess what? That was going to bring her home a little bit late and I needed to get dinner ready. Back. We need to beware of scheduling our life in such a way that we are incapable of making disciples. Either too busy or too closed off. We need to, I'll say that again. We need to beware of scheduling our lives in such a way that we are incapable of making disciples either too busy or too closed off. Amen? Some of us are too busy. Some of us are closed, too closed off. So some of these things, go where people are, follow up, frequent the same places, spend time with people, ask questions, encourage them, and all the rest, hopefully will help us uh, modify our schedule. I'd like you to go now to uh, Matthew chapter 9. So those are some of the actions that we take if we want to be disciples, making disciples. The second thing I want to talk about is what it sounds like for disciples to make disciples. And I'm going to simplify it for you. We could look at a ton of verses, but I'm just going to give you one line that I want you to take home with you today. And that line is, what did the Lord say? Can you say that back to me? What did the Lord say? Say it again. What did the Lord say? What did the Lord say? What did the Lord say? Right? There is a, we could talk about this, and we will and should, about all the different things we should talk about. But one of the, the basic fundamental things, if you're discipling a new person or someone in the church already, that we should have in our, in our verbiage, in our vocabulary, is the concept of, well, what did the Lord say? Because what is the Great Commission? It's to teach them to observe whatever I command so it goes back to the things that Jesus said. If Dan Kutcher calls me one day, faithful brother, he calls me one day and says, man, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm having a tough day. Well, why, brother Dan? What's going on? I don't know, man. It, it, things, are just, things are just really tight at my job, and, and there's not enough work, and I'm, I'm worried about all these different things financially, and da 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 First thing I should do is I should be sympathetic to him. I should listen to him. I should love him. And then you know what I should say to him? I say, all right, brother, let's think about this now. Let's, let's do this together. What did the Lord say? What do you mean, what did the Lord say? I, I'm having a hard, trouble, a hard time thinking about anything right now. I'm just, I'm so stressed. Oh, well, one of the things the Lord said, brother, if you remember, is he said, don't worry about your life. So what you'll wear and, and what you'll, you know, where the money will come from and all these different things. But 
but focus on my kingdom because the people that don't believe in God worry about all those things and God cares about the sparrows and he cares about the lilies of the field don't you think he's gonna take care of us oh yeah you're right man I know that's not putting money in my bank right now but I'm gonna trust that the Lord is gonna be faithful you're absolutely right let's pray brother boom there it is what did the Lord say that's a perfect example that you and I can say to someone that's stressed out about financial things not that any of that would be the case in these days but anyway someone calls you up they say man I gotta tell you something you know that job you were praying for me to get and and, and uh, you know, I, I know I put it on the prayer list but I'll be honest with you I knew the likelihood of me getting that job was very slim I'm, I was the least qualified amongst them but man I just believe God that God wanted me at this place that time and guess what I got the job I got the job are you kidding me you got the job I got the job that's crazy what happened I don't know but my resume was on the bottom of the stack and it fell over and it went to the top and they called me up it was great this is wonderful what let me ask you a question you're rejoicing today what did the Lord say about what you should do with people that rejoice you should rejoice with them brother let's go out and get a root beer Right? And then we'll watch the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> Let's go out and sell. This is great. Let's go out to eat and celebrate. I'm buying because you didn't get a paycheck yet. So this is going to be great. Right? What did the Lord say? So whether it's suffering, whether it's rejoicing, whether it's everywhere in between, whether it's marriage, whether it's children, whether it's just frustration with the world and politics and let's let's be people that we hear each other saying this phrase well what did the Lord say well what did the Lord say because that's the way that we can help each other observe whatever he can and to the new people we're discipling who don't know what the Lord said you know what we can say you know what the Lord said that's what our word that's what it should sound like for us to make disciples what it should sound like for us to make disciples in John 8 it says as he spoke these things to them, many came to believe in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly what? Disciples, right? We're helping each other continue in his word by reminding each other what the Lord said. Isn't that great? All right. Now here's the last thing we'll look at. The actions of a disciple maker, the words of the disciple maker. And this, this last one is the most important. It's the heart of a disciple maker. Because you and I can, can write down the list of the practical things that I talked about this morning. And start hanging around where people are. And start you know, saying, well, what did the Lord say? Well, what did the Lord say? Well, what did the Lord say? Over and over again, right? But, but if we don't have the heart of a disciple, these things are, are eventually going to be in vain and they'll fizzle out. Well, it'll, it'll start strong, but it'll fizzle out because it's not something... That's, that's coming from the very inside of us from our heart. Amen. Some of you can recognize that already because you've been through phases like I have where you've been focused on discipleship and disciple making and it's fizzled out because it just happened to be the sermon series or the book that you were reading at the time but it didn't go into your heart. Amen. Look what, look what uh, we're in Matthew 9. You there? Matthew chapter 9. We read this last week. Jesus was going through all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And seeing the people, what happened? He felt compassion. You see that? Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. Because they... Matthew 9? Well, I don't know. 35. That's a good one. 35. Let's start it again. Ready? Jesus. Everybody there? Jesus was what? Going. Through all the what? Cities. Okay. And villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Healing every kind of disease. Every kind of sickness. Seeing the people he felt what? Compassion for them. Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. When Jesus saw people, he saw them in a certain way that led him to have compassion on them. He looked at them and he saw that they were, they were distressed 
and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd, wandering aimlessly. And it, it, it did something to his heart when he saw that. What do you and I see? What do you and I feel when we see people? Are they an irritation to us? Are they a nuisance to us? Are they, are they a pain in the butt because they're, they're going to make our lives more difficult or our wait on the checkout line longer? When Jesus saw people, He had compassion on them. That's what I want. If the Lord can soften my heart for humanity in general, I, I am convinced that I'll become a disciple. Because I'll care about people. Because I'll love people. Do I need to go where people are? Absolutely. Do I need to ask people, well, what did the Lord say? Absolutely. But if you and I don't have a heart for people and actually care about other people, it's going to go nowhere. It's going to go nowhere. What do you see when you see the other people in the church? What do you see when you see the people at your job? What do you look out and see when you see the crowd? You know, the reputation of Christians in America is not... Let me tell you about the Christians. They are the most loving people I've ever met. Right? If you Google search, Christians are so... And leave it there and let the instance suggest... You know, Google tell you what all the options are. It's mean, prideful, hypocritical, arrogant, fill-in-the-blank, phobic... Why isn't it Christians are the most wonderful people I've ever met? Because we don't have the heart of Christ. And that's what we need. We need the heart of Christ. Look what Francis Chan said. He said, Fulfilling Jesus' command to make disciples is about more than having the right theology or well-developed teaching points. Remember that if you understand all mysteries and all knowledge, yet don't have love, you're what? Earlier in the same letter, Paul said, If anyone imagines that he knows something... He does not yet know as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. It's not about what you know or about what you think you know. It's about what? It's about love. It's about love. If you're not willing to make loving God and loving people your highest priority, then stop. Seriously, walk away until you've settled this one essential point. Lack of love is the unmistakable mark of death. We know we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers, but whoever does not love abides in Making disciples isn't about gathering pupils to listen to your teaching. The real focus is not on teaching people at all. The focus is on loving them. The focus is on loving them. Jesus' call to make disciples includes teaching people to be obedient followers of Jesus Christ. But teaching isn't the end goal. Ultimately, it's about people being faithful to God's call to love the people around them. Love the people around them. It's about loving those people enough to help them see their need to love and obey God. It's about bringing them to the Savior and allowing Him to set them free from the power of sin and death and transform them into loving followers of Jesus Christ. It's about glorifying God by obediently making disciples who will teach others to love and obey God. And he says this in closing. So the question is, how much do you care about the people around you? When you stand in a crowd, interact with your family, or talk to people in your church, do you love them and long to see them glorify God in every aspect of their lives? Honestly assessing your heart and asking God to purify your motive, it needs to become the habit. Of see, because if we're not doing this for love's sake, we know it's biblical. In the last four weeks, have we not made the case that what Christians should be about is about making disciples? Is this biblical? Is this true? Is this what the church did? Absolutely. So we can agree at all the right points and say amen at all the right points and, and, and put on the bumper sticker and look at the sign out front that says discipleship. And that's wonderful and we'll do that and we should. But we need to, to, we need to ask God to soften our hearts for you. To care about them, To love them. If that happens, we're going to look at people and, and have compassion on them. Because they're distressed and dispirited, or they need encouragement, or they need a friend, or they need a phone call, or they need just more love because they're doing great and never anything wrong with giving more love. So, 
Let's look at the actions of a disciple maker. Let's consider the words of a disciple maker. And then let's assess each of our hearts as disciple maker candidates. If there's a disconnect in our heart, the other things aren't going to do us much good right now. If your heart is soft, then let's start going around where people are and asking people, what did the Lord say? Assess where you're at in this this morning. Something I'll do every once in a while before teen camp is I'll go to the Providence Place Mall, right? And, and I'll go there, and I'll just sit there. And I'll, I'll just watch the people in the mall. And I do that because I want, and I sit there and I ask the Lord to give me compassion on the people. And instead of just seeing, you know, all these teenagers dressed exactly the same way, and all of these parents, and the, the husband sitting next to me that's, you know, waiting for his wife to finish shopping, and all the rest of the normal things that you see in the mall, the Lord begins to open up my heart and see these people differently and seeing them how I think He sees them. He, he, he gives me compassion because I'm putting myself where people are. I'm saying, Lord, help me to see what you see in these people's lives. And I, I encourage you maybe to do that this week. Maybe go somewhere on your lunch break and just watch people and ask God to soften your heart while you're there to see what He says in the people, what He sees in the people around you. And, and I, and I want to close with asking you for the next week to, to pray every day for God to give you the heart of the disciple. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. It can be a long prayer. But, but every day, if you would pray this week, God, give me the heart of a disciple maker. You will be amazed at what God is going to do in even this short time if you would commit to that prayer. So let's start by praying that, that prayer now. And we'll have the praise team come up and close with our final song. Lord, too often I... Uh, well, I obey you just for the obedience sake. And I know that's good, but Lord, I'm asking that you would give us, give your people, give your church, give me a heart for the people around me for our families, for our fellow disciples, for the lost. Please, God, we pray that you would, you would uh, change our hearts so that we would have compassion on people. And I know the Christian church at large isn't known by this, but, but Father, that I would be and this church would be known by our love. That we are committed to making disciples and that means being committed to love people and help them to love people. Father, please, this week, may you uh, reveal yourself in a great way as we commit to pray. We commit to pray to be disciple makers and have the heart of a disciple maker this week. Please, Lord, change our hearts. Soften our hearts. Take out the stones that are in there. Put us in positions this week with people that drive us crazy. So that we are forced, even, to have compassion, Lord. Give us your eyes. Give us your heart. Help us be people who love others, love you.